All right, hello, and uh, thanks everyone for being here today. This is uh, Shut the Front Door. Uh, so let's get this out of the way right away. I want to thank the uh, B-Sides guys for doing this. Uh, good work today. All right, so what's this talk about? Well, uh, I'll be talking to you about RFID access controls, uh, which are shockingly bad. Uh, essentially, they leave your doors open for anyone with a bit of knowledge and a few dollars. Uh, so chances are one of the technologies I'm about to talk about is installed in a building that you work in. And since you're here, I'm assuming that you're security people, so this might give you a bit of a headache. Hopefully a few laughs. So uh, a couple questions. Has anyone here ever cloned an RFID card? A couple people, three or four or five. Okay, good. So hopefully this isn't repetition for too many. Uh, who has one in their pocket? Oh, awesome, okay. So, okay. This is like that Charlie Miller talk where he tries to get to your phone with Bluetooth. Okay, the person that I've never met. Uh -huh. <laughs> Unwitting chills. All right. What are you trying to teach them in the first place? I just copied his card, okay? That's how easy it was. <laughs> okay. So, a little about me. I work on the attack and pen team at Acuvant Labs. Uh, I do net pen, vulnerability assessments, social engineering, and uh, physical penetration testing. So the latter is obviously what got me interested in today's topic. As I said, the stuff I'm about to say, it's been said before, it's not groundbreaking research, but I, I think maybe no one is listening, or people just don't get how bad it is. <laughs> But you know what really grinds my gears? I've worked on sites all over North America and Europe, and apparently no one got the news. Uh, each time I get to a new site, it became more apparent that there was a general lack of understanding of how bad the problems are. If this were like a network vulnerability, it'd be like finding out servers in your web farm are vul vulnerable to an O-Day with code execution, and it's in Metasploit, and just not bothering to patch. So, now, I realize that most companies basically use these controls to prevent any random from wandering in off the street and using the washrooms, but the locks on, and the, the locks on most doors are just as vulnerable. But when you see someone picking a lock on a door, you know that something's up. Uh, and, and when someone beeps through a door, it actually lends credibility to them just because of perception. And the businesses that we do assessments for, they get owned by nation states. They're targets. So these guys should be really wanting to lock the front door. So that's rant mode off. So HID Prox, which is the technology that I just cloned, is completely insecure as demonstrated by this $40 Chinese device that any of you can buy from AliExpress or eBay. In fact, uh, Prox tags can be read uh, from three feet away with this little toy. Now this is based on a, another uh, design on the internet, but it's, it's a parking garage uh, reader, but it's been modified with some, some Arduino hardware. So there it is in operation up there. I just have to walk by someone with this in a book bag, and their card is stored on my SD card in memory so I can create a duplicate later. Uh, here's an example of the unit in operation. And as a pen tester, this is what I want, easy mode. I don't like working hard. Uh, as a customer, or someone designing security products, uh, this is exactly the opposite of what you want. In most cases, RFID credentials in use today are this easy to copy. So there are a couple different types of uh, RFID that is used for access control. Now, this is a, an over-generalization, -gener but uh, for today, this is what we're going with. Low frequency, HID Prox, HID is the brand, by the way, and Indala, uh, they fit into that category. Both are vulnerable, we're only gonna talk about Prox and high frequency, which is a more modern RFID. Most, most modern RFID is high frequency for access control. Uh, it's I HID iClass and MyFair, and we've heard all about vulnerabilities in MyFair, the Dutch transit system, and so on and so forth. There's other things like uh, the 407, but they use uh, active transponders that are in the, uh, in the 800, 900 megahertz range. Okay. So let's get right into it. You probably all recognize these readers. That's the uh, HID 5335. They're everywhere. Uh, HID was originally formed in 91. 
And this technology is now tw over 20 years old. It was originally used for animal monitoring and uh, tire tracking. So it's by far the most common type of access control system, even in my work today. Uh, uh, HID boasts over 200 million cards sold, and I'm betting the lion's share of them are this technology still in the market today. So picture on the left is the 5335. Very common reader, as I said. The Pearson International Airport is full of these things. And after you learn how insecure they are, you're going to wonder why bother with the x-ray scans and the genital scans and the shit like that. <laughs> so... Prox was designed in an era when electronics was pretty much the domain of electronics engineers. Uh, it was a bit hard to imagine that electronics would ever be as accessible as they are today, but it happened. Uh, Arduino blew the doors open, and as you know, things are only going that way at, at a more accelerated pace. Uh, Prox, as I said, is insecure by design. The card is not encrypted at all. If you power it, it will just start spitting out your identification bits. Okay, neither is the wireless. The wireless, if, if you can sit there with an SDR or some other device, some radio capable of, of listening to that frequency, you'll hear the bits if you can demodulate them. So this attack can theoretically capture signals from even further away by, like for, in a car, for example. And the last piece of the puzzle is the communications to the back end. Now, this is uh, done with a protocol called Wiegand and it's also unprotected completely. Uh, it's, it's where the easy vulns are, and it's worth noting that it's still around in the next generation readers. So here are the things that you really want to consider when evaluating the security of an RFID access control system. The card, the RF, the hardware, and the back-end communications. Every factor here must be executed perfectly for a secure system. No one really bothered with the hardware on Prox because there was no point, everything was so broken. Here's a little tip. Don't trust an RFID vendor. I've been on way too many sites where they're like, yeah, we're secure. We're using these encrypted tokens. And it was like, I just showed you here. Beep, beep. Okay, I'm in your, in your door. Get a trusted third party to review your plan and hardware proposed prior to installation for anyone here that's in charge of installing these things. Okay, well, I talked a little bit about the Wiegand protocol. The, the Wiegand interface is remarkably simple. Uh, and really, this is where it's at in terms of having fun with HID procs. There are two lines. Let's, let's not talk about ground for a second. There's data zero and data one. And as you can guess it, when it drops to zero volts on one of the lines, that's a zero or a one, respectively. So here we have the Slaley Logic uh, screenshot, and you can see the, the bit stream here. So what can we do with these bits now that we know what they are? Well, with a standard 26-bit card, there's eight bits for the facility code. And that's the card I... I just cloned. Eight bits, so the facility code on, the, on this card in particular is 21, and that's the only private piece of information on the card. Every other bit of information you need to make a new card is written on the actual card itself. And usually these cards, uh, they're ordered in batches of 100, so the facility code is going to be the same for at least 100 cards, maybe 1,000, you never know. Okay, so, and here's an example of where it's printed on the card. This is a different card number, but uh, just for illustrative purposes. So, there's the card code right there. We're converting, of course, from binary to uh, decimal. And so now, now that we have all these bits, uh, what can we do with them? So what does all this mean? So, we copy the card after that. How do we make a copy? Well, the tools that we use to copy it need the card's value in hex. So we convert our bitstream into hex. So every uh, prox card actually has 44 bits of data on it, but the reader never transmits some of the bits. Uh, but luckily they're static, so it's easy. We can add them in here. So those two first bits are, are what we add to the pad, which is the static bits I told you about, and we get that value. Then we convert the remaining bits, and we get those, we, we stick those two together, now, you can email this card to anyone, you can, and they can make a new card with, with uh, any one of the number of tools that's available on the market today. So, and getting to the Wiegand data is remarkably simple. HID has gone and uh, labeled things very nicely, as you see, data zero, data one, the tamper, which is never hooked up. <laughs> so, the Wiegand protocol can be exploited in a number of ways. Like, we can put little gremlins inside this thing. They, they left us like a lot of space for adding electronics to these things, and that's why I could do it there and here. 
uh, for example, we could put a microcontroller in that listened to the Wigan signal and just recorded everyone's card as, as they were buzzing in in the morning. Or, for example, we could brute force the lines. It only takes 50 milliseconds for one card read to go across the Wigan line. So that's 65,535 theoretical cards in 30 minutes. That's pretty easy. Or we could combine the replay attack idea with the bug, add some wireless, maybe Bluetooth or uh, 802.11, and we have a remote control door opener. Pretty awesome. Uh, spoiler alert, Eric, the next guy, and I are, are actually building that, hopefully, uh, to, to add to this presentation. So in summation, the Wigan protocol is completely fail, and so is HID procs in general. Now, HID came up with this secure alternative called iClass. And uh, we've had customers, oh, I'm, I'm iClass, I'm protected, these cards are encrypted. Well, we know a couple of years ago from uh, a couple of smart guys that that's not true. I'll get into that. iClass uses encrypted credentials and encrypted wireless communications, uh, poorly encrypted. Uh, so it turns out JK, uh, they're not really secure, they just, they screwed up. Uh, you can tell these devices by their curved front, and sometimes they have other manufacturers' names on them, like Bosch or Honeywell, but they're all white-labeled. They're the same, same device. The, the weakened attacks we talked about are still good on these devices because the back end is still unencrypted. Why encrypt the card and, and the data on the card if you're just going to spit it out in plain text on the back end? I have no freaking idea. So for iClass, uh, Hen Henrik Plotz and uh, Milos Mariak figured out how to circumvent the protection of the micro because they put, uh, um, like, not a commercial grade micro, they put a microchip microcontroller in it, which they figured out how to put in a high voltage programming mode and dump the firmware. Uh, after that, it was game over. They had the encryption keys, and they found that the encryption keys on this system were used worldwide, the same keys. So, fail. <laughs> Now, if you find a tool that will decrypt triple DES, you can read the encrypted portions of the card. You, if you can implement it, you're, you're good to go. Uh, so this image de uh, depicts an attack that's a bit different. It uses an FTDI cable to bit bang uh, the PIC programming header uh, in order to dump the data. It's just slightly different. So thanks to those guys I just mentioned, uh, they created this tool. Now we can read an iClass card. So I read the data from one using a USB reader, which I have here today. I have pretty much all this stuff here today if you want to see it later. The iClass card uh, has encrypted data on blocks 7 to 9, which are uh, highlighted there. Now, if you notice, blocks 8 and 9, if you can't see at the back, they're the same. That tells us, whoops, HID used triple DES in ECB mode, which allows us to do uh, some heuristics on the data to see, well, that's probably all zeros. Let's see. So now I've decrypted it, and sure enough, yes, all zeros. And uh, doesn't track seven look a lot like the data that was on the old HID prox card? Well, uh, spoiler alert, it is the same. <laughs> so they, they, they use the same system of facility code and card code on this new card that has a kilobyte of storage. They're, they're using like four bytes here. <laughs> so. If we convert the hex data from block seven, we can see it's the same. I'll just go through this quickly. Block seven was this. We go to the binary, and again, the, uh, the left side is the card code, and the right side is, sorry, other way around. The left side is facility, right side is card code. Decode it, it's 16189. So it's pretty easy. Also, so as I said, the data comes out on the back end unencrypted. Uh, so if you were to put a logic pro, uh, probe on the Wigan data output, you would see that stream again. And uh, some iClass even have serial output, which we don't even have to convert the bits, it just gives them to us. And that's uh, this one right here has that, and I'm going to use, use that later on. So we just decoded 6189. In this case, that's the actual card and the USB reader that I used to, to get that data. Uh, and then, so since the encryption key is leaked, to clone iClass, 99% of the time, all you need is that block seven data. There are, encryptions, uh, there are ex exceptions, but for the most part, this is true. Uh, and then you just need a way to write to the card. So in this instance, we can use USB in that program that I showed you, but it's not uh, generally available to the public. Uh, so I was doing some research one day and I figured out you can do it with just the iClass reader and the serial protocol, because this is an RW300, not, not an R300, it's read-write 300. 
So I designed, or I, I put together this portable cloner so I didn't have to use a computer because when on site, you don't really want to pull out your laptop and try to convince someone to like scan their card. I've done it, but it's, it takes some explaining. <laughs> so uh, as I said, they, they, this has an RS-232 out, so I just need a level converter. I first wrote the code in Python and then ported it to C. The hardest part was you have to load the actual encryption keys into the reader and do all kinds of like key derivation for triple des and XORing and stuff like that, which is not very hard, but it's just confusing <laughs> because they don't implement triple des properly. So uh, I took a Teensy 3.1 board, which is uh, the thing on the bottom there, which is very tiny little boards. So because I wanted it to be very uh, portable and I wanted to be able to shove this thing in a wall maybe in the future and control a reader. And uh, I have this device uh, here today. So I'm going to give you a demo shortly. And this is just uh, for scale. <laughs> we have the 3.1 ARM dev board and they bolted on the TTL converter, which is from China and very, China's a great place for electronics, AliExpress. So uh, let's quickly do this demo. Pray to the demo gods. So, can everyone read this? So, th this is not on right now. Let's turn it on. Success. Okay. So, yeah, we can... Uh, let's mic this thing. We can do all kinds of fun things. You can program songs into it. And uh, as I said, uh, when, when you read a card... There you go. So, 5A is the end, end of that string, and as you see on this card, it's 5A, so we'll read it again just to prove. If anyone else has an I-class card, they can bring it up, and I can show you, this is, show you what your uh, data is. This is a different card. So each time, it just spits out the, the, the bytes unencrypted uh, via serial. So I'm going to stick the card there and leave it there this time, and then I'm going to try to read a section, uh, the block 7 of the memory with the reader. So I've got, it's been controlled by serial right now, but I could put buttons on this. All of this is running in the Teensy 3.1, so I could put buttons on it and, and do all of this uh, uh, completely standalone uh, of the computer. I just didn't have time to implement that. So what we've read here is nothing because I haven't selected the proper key to authenticate to the card yet. So you see those FFFFF, that's the data that should be coming back from block seven. So if I select the key, I get a 52,9000, which is the hex code for all good. And then I go read. And of course, now we get the encrypted data. And so I'll remind you that this card is, ends in 54 when I scan it. But if I select the key again, and I write the other demo card to it, now it's, it's been written, take it away. And now it's a different card. So there you go an I-class card cloned, which you're not supposed to be able to do, <laughs> especially using the own reader. And just for fun, we will uh, change it back. So select the key again, and then now when we scan it again, if it will scan, there we go, and it's back. And one more, one more song. All right. Do I have time left here? How much time do I have? All right, so I have a few more slides. I thought, I, I think I skipped through some stuff because I was nervous, but um, let's talk about a few other things then. Yeah, this was my ending slide at first. Uh, I thought it was pretty clever, but apparently you don't. So, uh, this, is, this is how HID implements security on these readers, by the way. They pour a bunch of epoxy into them, so you can't get access to the electronics. So dudes take like uh, 
pretty dangerous stuff like uh, concentrated nitric acid, acid and pour it on there to get to the board and, and do reverse engineering on them. It's kind of neat. Uh, and this is ab absolutely terrifying. So these I-class devices, they hook up to the network. So how often do you guys know that of uh, any institution that updates the firmware on their door readers? Never. So if there's bugs, I mean, and these things work offline as well, which means all of the credentials and the data for authenticating people is stored inside the reader. Terrifying. And still, advertising the Wigan interface. Complete fail. Uh, here's a MyFair card, and uh, this card, I was on site in Germany, and the customer is like, yeah, this is encrypted. We're using uh, Desfire cards. And of course, I found that they're only using the card's serial number. They're not actually using the encrypted portion of the card for the identification purposes. So all we did was read the card's serial number, used a Proxmark to uh, emulate it, and opened the door on him, and he pooped himself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this lock is completely offline, so it's not networked. So you can't even tell when someone has opened it unless you uh, go to the actual door and download the data. So MyFair, I will give them some props. Uh, you probably can't see it. Uh, but they actually own up to the, uh, the, the weaknesses in their card uh, right on their website. You know, and th this is a huge list of weaknesses. And uh, they, they know that the weaknesses are because they relied on the secrecy of their cryptography algorithm uh, for, for, for the, the protection of the data. And we know in cryptography that's a huge no-no. Uh, and then here, they explain at the end, although residual, uh, residual risk it remains, there are techniques and countermeasures to detect cards and data which have been tampered with, but they're secret. It's like, no one can ever learn. Bruce Schneier actually said, the security of MyFair Classic is terrible. This is not an exaggeration. It's kindergarten cryptography. Anyone with security experience would be embarrassed to put his name on the design. Uh, and this is us in Germany, again, this is my coworker, where we found a MyFair Classic card that was using a, um, uh, you being in use for a cafeteria system, and people would actually stick money, euros in the machine, it would recharge the machine. So of course we broke the card, and we uh, recharged it ourselves and started buying stuff at the cafeteria. And, and the great thing is you could actually go and get cash refunds, so we were making some money on this gig. <laughs> All right. So I've got a bunch of links here, too, if you're interested in some of this stuff. As I said, this is kind of standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, the only original stuff was I worked with the guy from proxclone.org to understand how to talk to this reader. Uh, but come to me after, for sure. I see a, is there a hand up there in the back? Yep. Uh, not for the RFID stuff usually, I tell them that it's really broken and what they should look for to fix their system. Uh, I, apparently the new I-Class SE line has learned from a lot of the problems after like much pain. But for example, they have readers that uh, are multi-class, and this is one of the SE readers here. It says right on it, multi-class SE. So this will read a standard prox the upgraded I-Class, and then the I-Class SE. I'm convinced that there's no way they turn off the legacy portions of this, so it's, it's always going to remain vulnerable as well. So it's, it's I, I don't know. And, and configuration is also a huge issue because the vendors, and that's why I said never trust the vendors, they always misconfigure something, so it's, we're, we're getting in one way or another. Yeah. Uh, I have never encountered one. I know that you know, in terms of biometrics, uh, HID originally was they were storing biometric data on the card for verification. So if you could get one a reader that was an enrolling reader, you could enroll your thumbprint on a card. Then, because we know the where the data, uh, how to access the data, you can just overwrite someone's legit card with your thumbprint and like and go in and just you're, you'll be valid that your thumb will work. Uh, no, they, not in the systems that I'm talking about, not that I've ever run into. I'm sure that exists, 
but uh, again, you're talking like military or high, some, some other high security installation probably. All right, thank you very much for your time.